There was a young husband who was in a department store with his baby while his wife was paying something that she just purchased. And the baby was crying and wailing and crying. How do you like to go in the, in the big department stores and the baby is making a, like a big thing? Like everybody look at you like you've done something wrong, your baby is, is abnormal or something. So the father seemed very quite controlled and calm. And he looked at his baby and he would say to his baby, easy now, Albert control your temper. Easy now, Albert, control your temper. So a woman who was passing by him said, Sir, I must congratulate you. You seem to know just how to speak to baby. He says, Well, I'm not speaking to the baby. My name is Albert. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Maybe you know what I'm talking about. So this morning, we want to talk about control. To be in control or to be controlled by. Amen? And our first verse is in Galatians, a verse that we know so much. And uh, I use this Bible version because it's a, it says it a bit different and I really like how it says it. It says, God's Spirit makes us instead of the fruit of the Spirit is. Wow, it's so, so good to see it and like this because kind of the, the fruit of is kind of a, a bit detached from it. It's like something that happens. But he says the Spirit makes it in me. That's what he makes. He makes me loving. He makes me happy. I remember when I was saved. I was a bit depressed before and I had been nine years in drugs and I was, didn't like my life and where I was in life, I had no hope for the future. And that night when Jesus Christ came into my heart, I was set free. I was set free and I was so happy. I was happy to be a Christian. I had love in my heart. I had, I was, I had found peace and it changed my heart. God the Spirit makes us loving, happy. How many of you, you still feel God makes me happy? If you're happy, turn to your neighbor and give them a smile. Says, I'm happy. I'm happy. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You know, to be happy in the Lord. I want you to realize something this morning. If you are happy in the Lord, it's what the Holy Spirit is doing. It's a fruit. It's the fruit. It's the product of the Holy Spirit in you. And if you look at that text here, the last one is self-control. Oh, no. Not this one. I like the three first one. Loving, happy, peace. Oh, I feel good. But self-control, I don't like it so much. Because it has the word self and control together. What does that mean? I have to change my habits, my pattern of life, my excess. I'm eating too much. I'm lazy. Uh, I need to learn how to restrain myself from all sorts of things. And sometimes some Bible version use the word uh, temperance, abstain of. Wow, these are, I don't want to do these things, you know. <laughs> and also if you notice that the Holy Spirit here puts the self-control in the last thing, in the list. Does that mean that it is the least in importance? No, I don't think so. It's not by importance that they are listed. Because, as you will see this morning, self-control is vital, essential, and it's for your benefit, it's for your happiness, it is for your success, and for your advance in life. Without it, we're not going anywhere. We will be miserable Christians, we will be dissatisfied, we will be complainers, we will not, you know, have the rest. Because joy, happy, peaceful, patient kind of, uh, is connected to self-control. It, it's, it's all interconnected, so we, we, need, we need that. So the term self-control this morning also gives us some uh, wrong impression by the word self because it says God's Holy Spirit makes us. The fruit of the Spirit is. 
So maybe we should call self-control by another name to help us understand really what it is. Because self-control, we know that in this world we have people who exercise self-control without God. You, you know that, eh? Fashion celebrities, sports celebrities, they can go a long way of self, you know, they can stop eating. They can make themselves skinny. They can, you know, make themselves fat. They can change their appearance as much as they need. Uh, you know some of the sports celebrities, uh, Tiger Woods. What do you know about him? He's a great athlete. He's one of the best golfers in the world. But as he was exercising self-controls in the areas of the physical, in the areas of the morality, whoops, something didn't work out so well. Uh, some politicians, some very famous people, you know the IMF, International Monetary Fund's former directors, uh, Yes, Strauss-Kahn was, you know, very disciplined on certain things, on finance and all of this, but in politics and diplomacy, but in his personal moral life, he was a total failure. So, so you see that sometimes people will try to exercise self-control in a certain area of their life, but in other areas it's not going to work so successfully. Because, there's a simple reason, because without biblical belief, absence of biblical belief will lead to an absence of self-control. It's connected together because it is produced by the Holy Spirit. And if you remove the Holy Spirit of that, what you get is what we call asceticism, uh, self, extreme self-denial, like uh, fasting for, you know, making you like uh, so, so skinny, like uh, uh, trying to uh, attain nirvana under the tree on the top of the mountains or something like that. Try to impose yourself, self, uh, very hard things. Some people whip themselves, some people crucify themselves in the Philippines in Easter time. So people can do uh, a lot of things uh, with religion. So it is uh, either self-denials or it is also legalism. What religion has to offer? What is the Old, the Old Testament law has to ask of us? Don't do this. You must do this. You must not do this. You must not kill. You must not covet. You must not lie. You must not be envious. And we do all of the above. We hate someone, we cheat someone, we lie to someone, we covet someone, we are envious of someone else. It says don't do it and we do it all, we break all of them. Because religion doesn't have the, the power to do it and that's why the Old Testament was a failure. That's why Jesus came, that's why salvation was offered to us for reconciliation after it proved that man cannot save themselves by following the law, the Old Testament law. Amen? So we're talking about this morning the spirit producing by indwelling us this control. So we should change the word self-control by spirit inner control power or some kind of terminology like this to understand really what we're talking about. Because self and it kind of mess up the, the terms and itself. Do we have a role into it? And we have to, to have the, the willingness to make some choices and to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. That's the self part. But the power comes from the Holy Spirit and the success part. The other slide gives us a, a text here that talks about uh, w what rule over us. Are we slave? Are we free? And all this. For you are a slave to whatever controls you. Is there something that controls you, that you are obsessed with, that you, you are practicing all the time, that it is so important, you cannot go without it, you would not yield that, no way, this is mine and I'm going to keep it, whether rights or, or an attitudes or uh, uh, some moods or some, whatever habits, or whatever it is. And the, the real Text. If we want to explain this verse a bit more, uh, looking at, at the, I think I'm looking at the Amplified here, but it is also the, the King James would see it very similar. For by whatever or whom, the King James used whom, someone or something. For by whatever or by whom anyone is made inferior or worse, in a worse state, brought down. Okay, we have standards, we are, okay, average, 
not good, not bad. We are pretty good person. Whoever brings you worse, whatever leads you downhill instead of uphill, that's what it means here, or is overcome by something, to that person or to that thing, he is enslaved. That's what this text is. Whatever person, whatever thing, lead you in a worse state than you are already. Pull you down instead of up like in godliness or overcome you. It's, you cannot help yourself. You're under these things. You are slave of that. Okay? That's what the text is talking about. So we want to talk a bit about rule and mastery. And I'm using the next verse, a uh, text that related to the water baptism that we are going to have on May 1st. Therefore, do not let sin reign. Okay? And then in verse 14 it says, For sin will have no mastery over you. And these are two special expressions that you need to pay attention to. The first one, uh, do not let sin reign. It is a personification of sin. Sin becomes like a king that rule over the rule like a king. This is sin is described to us as something that rules over our thought life and our bodies. Because the, the sin, the king's sin, rules over our passion. It rules over what we think. It rules over like our ambitions and, and all these kind of things. And whoever rules over what we think and our, and our thoughts is going to rule over our body. You understand that? Whatever rules here will rule in the rest of our life. So that is what it says here. Therefore, do not let king sin reign over your body. And then you, you present, your, your, you offer your body as an instrument of unrighteousness and sinfulness and all of this. Instead, you give your life to God. And this is a call here. If you are going to be baptized, if you have been baptized, remind yourself that accepting to be baptized is a surrender, a yielding, a once and for all of your body, of your soul, of your, of your spirit to God. Once and for all, you don't offer to King Sin this life like you used to be dominated by it before. It's over. I'm giving it all to the Lord. And it is the only conditions by which this one, sin will have no mastery. If this, is, this first step in baptism is not done, this yielding, this surrendering, this call to give yourself completely, body, soul, and spirit to God, you are not going to grow. You are not to be peaceful. You are not to be growing. You are not going anywhere. This is a condition. So do it now, do it completely, and then this way sin will not be a master. And this expression here, sin will have no mastery over you, this expression is to exercise lordship or to be supreme in authority. Sin will have no more authority, will not exercise sovereignty over your body or everything anymore. So, so it is important, so self-control is a very important, dominant, essential, vital uh, uh, expression of God's character in us and development that will set us free. Either we control or we are being controlled. That's what this text is talking to us about this. And this little party, I already commented on that, because we are not under the law but under grace. The law asks you to control yourself based on self-denial and then do's and don'ts and rituals. And it is the flesh trying to overcome the flesh and it's not going to work. That's what the law uh, does, religion does. It's not going to work, only the power of the Holy Spirit. Think about someone in the Bible who lacks self-control. Can you name one? Samson, of course, Samson is the greatest example. I think Samson's story is one of the saddest stories in the Bible. Always, that's what I think. He was raised by the Lord from before his birth 
to be a judge and a deliverer. Wow, this is something serious. Think about that. To be a conqueror, to be a deliverer and a judge, to have sound mind, to be able to, to bring government, to bring justice in the land, to, to set people free and all of this. And he was not even able to control his body. Passion, it took him away. He lost his eyes his reputation and everything. And it again at the end of his life, it's God's grace again. You know, he was a Nazarite by birth. No alcohol was to come to him, not a drop. He was not going to come. So there's a lot of discipline. There was a lot of things for him. He was called, raised by God. And if you look at Achan, Eve, David, Amnon, you will find similar things. They saw something, they wanted something so badly they want to do this is the age in which we live right now we live like that we see something we stare at it we keep it in our mind we will not let it go we must have it now even if we don't have money we will put it on credit this is the life that we live right now it is clear that our greedy human appetites can easily lead lead to sinful excess in a very prosperous society like we, we live, look, in the few years, for those of you who were in Hong Kong, I've been here for 23 years. 23 years ago, there were very few Hong Kong people who were obese. Now, the children all over, there is a growth. This, I'm not talking and I'm not making fun. And I'm not, uh, don't, don't confuse me. You, sometimes you become obese because of the glands, a change, someone becomes pregnant, uh, there's a change in the hormones in the body. We understand that. It's not always uh, because of bad habits. But you see a growth in number of obese people in affluent countries. This is an indication of something. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. Also, because people want to get more and more things, material things and fun and activities and all sorts of things, uh, with, without mon money, you can get things today. Just get the little plastic card, just roll it in the machine and all of this. We have money-making machines. How many of you love the money-making machine? This is great. You don't have money in your pocket, you go to the machine, you put your cards and then you get money. It's wonderful, it's wonderful. So, but now, now the, every nation has fallen into the same trap. Nations are spending trillions of dollars to try to cover for their overstretched budget. And this is all in the indication of a society that lacks self-control. We cannot control ourselves, so we are paying for the consequences of that. Our appetites for Christian, our appetites for comfort, the good life, you know, the prosperity, the good life, and, and God bless us, and we enjoy the good life. Do you enjoy the good life? I enjoy the good life. I'm thankful for the good life. But our appetites for the comforts and pleasure can become a master if self-control does not balance. So self-control must be present all over our life. Money, food, um, relationship, it, it must be everywhere. If the spiritual does not govern the physical, we become an easy target for Satan because of a lack of self-control. I'll give you an example, marriage. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. Do not deprive each other of sexual relationship. We are married, we have sexual relationship, but we decide to go fasting for a while and to come near to God, so we say, okay, let's do it. Uh, so, And then it says, after a time, come back together, because you should come back together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Oh, and this is true in marriage, this is true in sexuality. Now we're not talking about sexual sins and perversion, we're talking about holy a holy place, the holy plan of God, even within the confines of our own bedrooms and marriage, there's problems. Already there, Satan has access. So if Satan has access and he can even d destroy marriage, that d doesn't have to, to go outside, just from within, because of problems with our own sexuality. It, people divorce because of that. People go to have affairs because it starts right there at home. Satan 
can get to us because of a lack of self-control. And, and then, this is not the only uh, area, it put it in any other areas of relationship. First John chapter 2, verse 16, we don't have it here, but talks about the three Ps. Passion, pride, and pleasure. Passion, pleasure, and pride. And this is the what we, is, we are struggling with all the time, all the time. If these forces, passion, pleasure, and pride, dominate our lives, instead of our spiritual ability to connect with God, we will delay obedience. We're not ready now because pleasure is more important than the obedience that we know God is asking of us. Or we will refuse to obey what we know is God's will. And we will accept sin because these things, passion, pleasure, or pride, are the elements that are dominating over my life and not the Holy Spirit inner control in, in my life. Amen? Amen? Now I want to go a bit further and give to you uh, three New Testament groups of words that will help us to understand more in depth uh, the importance of, uh, of, of self-control. Uh, three, three groups, you can just click, 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 all of them. Uh, we have the, the, these three groups of words. These, whatever Bible version you use, you will find that these words are intermixed, like depending on which Bible version, but they are more or less the same. But they are divided into three groups. The Enkratia group, which is, come from Kratos, just remember this one as the power. Power to control, power to say no, power to abstain, power. The strength, the inner strength, so that is one word. The second group is so, sophonismos, which is uh, the sophos, that means uh, uh, wisdom. That's the, the sophia, philosophy, the, the, the love of uh, uh, wisdom. So that's the wisdom, the ability to, to think before acting, to be prudent, to, you know, these kind of things. And the third group here is about uh, keeping a clear mind. Uh, regardless of circumstances, and we will see how this being uh, applied through uh, Bible scriptures uh, with us here. Let's look at the first group, and we find a two Bible verse here. First Corinthians chapter seven, verse nine. That goes back to the same chapter we looked before for marriage. We're still in marriage here, but now we're talking to single. Huh? So if you are single this morning, but if they can't control themselves they should go ahead and marry because it's better to marry than to burn with passion. Okay, so they cannot control themselves in the areas of sexuality. They will go into fornications, they will go into sexual sins, they will come get into bondage or whatever, they cannot control that. Then marriage is better than to live a life of disorder, of sexual disorders and everything. There's, Th that's what it means. There's no self-control in this area of sexuality. Then it's very dangerous and it will destroy something of that person. So that is what this is talking about. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25, we find here a comparison of the Christians with an athlete. Everyone who enters an athletic contest practices self-control or uh, shows uh, uh, is it a temperate is temperate or is discipline and everything or exercise self restraint so here is power i can control it i have the power the inner power the inner strength it's there i i i i i need something like just an athlete and i can control my diet I can control the time I go to sleep and I wake up in the morning. I can control my physical training. I have this inner possibility uh, inside of me. Paul, a little bit further in chapter 9, says that, uh, he, he says, I beat my body and my Kate make it my slave. So what he is saying is that his body is under his dominion and control of his mind. His body 
obeys his mind. He has the, the mind, the power in his mind to control his body and not the other way around because many times the body, the, the needs, the physical, the sexuality, uh, the hunger, we want to drink with excess, we want to eat with excess, we want to do things with excess because our, our worldly appetites, our human appetites control our mind. But Paul says, I beat my body and I treat it as a slave. So in other words, I'm stronger. I have the power for that. The second group uh, is the verse Sophos, wisdom, and it is be of sound mind. Be of sound mind. Be reasonable. Good sense. Judgment. Moderation. Sensibly. Prudent or mental soundness. And we have that in Titus 2.6. In the same way, encourage the young men to live wisely. Some Bible we see was used to be self-control, self-discipline, to show temperance. They will use all of these things to live sensibly, to live with wisdom, to be prudent. Because th these words are all in interrelated, but this one here refers more to use wisdom, s s common sense, good judgment. Th that's different from the other one before it was, I have the strength, inner strength to control something, some appetites. This one is like, I'm able to think before acting. I'm able to make the difference between what, is, what will be destructive for me. What is not beneficial for me? What, what kind of consequences it will bring into my life? I have the ability to use wisdom to sort out these things. To be prudent. Prudence. Before signing the contract. You know? Before spending the money. Before using credit. Uh, uh, before uh, yielding into uh, infatuations or sexual relationship. Or, or, you know, the boyfriend says, if you love me, then, you know. <laughs> oh, yes, I love you. Do you really love me? Yes, you know, I do. If you do love me, then. <laughs> well, yes, I love you, but I don't want to do it. Yeah. Okay, uh, mental soundness and moderation and everything. Then you have another one. I like the other one because it's, it's very special, uh, 1 Timothy 2.9. And I desire that women should adorn themselves. They were talking about clothes, appearance. Adorn themselves modestly, appropriately, and sensibly. Now we're talking about you know, self-control and to shopping. You go to shopping mall. And you need self-control. Can you think about this? You need self-control in the shopping mall. Yes. And also, you need to think about something. I was reading an article not too long ago. And why do Christian girls take sexy selfies? Okay. Did you understand what I just said? Why do Christian girls seem to be taking a lot of sexy selfies? Sexy selfies, you know what I mean by that? Yeah? You understand that? Like to the pause, the clothes, the look, uh, you know? Can I imitate it? No. no. Mm. Okay. You see it on Facebook, you see it everywhere. So why? Why is it? And here the words of this, this text here is like, Modesty, appropriately, and sensibly, it makes sense. If you go to church, you're not at the beach. <laughs> that makes sense. So the, 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 the clothes that I wear at church should not reflect the beach. On May 1st, you can dress for May 1st. <laughs> but Sunday morning, you can dress like it is Sunday morning. So self-control here is like using your wisdom then to do what is appropriate to each situation that will also reflect the character of God and to be the right thing to, to do. It's to be sensible, to use sense, to use good judgment. Okay, the grace of God that appeared bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to say no to ungodliness. So there's, we say no and we choose, we make it a choice to live sensibly, correctly, and godly and the present age. Then the present age, it's always going to be ungodly. 
It's the present age. So if it is, and you know, we, we live in a society and the present age influence us. But here it says, because of the self-control in the sense of wisdom, common sense, good judgment, and all of these things, mental soundness, to be reasonable, I can sort out, and I'm not going to let the present age dominate how I think, how I dress, how I behave. I have something higher, more noble, I have higher goals than to let these things happen, because the Holy Spirit gives me self-control. Amen? Third group, Nifo group. This one is more, like I said before, uh, clear-headed. And that means free from excess, any sorts of excess. Drunkenness, rashness, to be well-balanced. And it, I, I like this way here, be self-possessed in all circumstances. And, and this text here is like, okay, let's say somebody insult you. Your mood change, is that right? You become gloomy, I've been rejected, I've been humiliated, or you get angry, or something like that. So in that sense here, you can go into depression, uh, anger, revenge, get back, or you know, these kind of things. But this word here means you don't go into excess, you keep a clear-minded, and circumstances do not control either your mood, you don't get into excess. When Jesus Christ comes again, we will be alert and fully sober. So we are clear-headed. 2 Timothy 4, 5. Here is, it's good because we're talking about ministry. You see, you are a missionary, a pastor, an evangelist, or involved in church ministry of any kind. You've been called by God. But then you go through hardship, no money, rejections, difficulties of different kinds at home, uh, all sorts of cer uh, external circumstances. It is easy to lose your focus, get confused, get weakened, get discouraged, and quit. Isn't that? Because there's too much pressure. There could be prison threats, and then you, 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 you lose because you get afraid, you, you get nervous, you, you lose your mind about these things. And you may go into uh, rash or impetuously make a decision. I have a pastor, a friend of mine that told me before, when I came on my first minor missionary journey to Hong Kong, oh, I love it. You know, it was in August and it was so hot. And we were crossing the border with Bibles, you know, in our pockets and stra strapped to our arms, to our legs, to our torso. We had pockets. I had a long sleeve, tie, coat. August, you're sweating everywhere. It's like a river is cutting. But you just love it. <laughs> I'm a missionary. I'm suffering for Jesus. It's so wonderful. And you know, sometimes you are on the high, eh? says, oh, me, I'm ready to move to Hong Kong. I enjoy my experience. Every smell, even the bad smell in the street. <laughs> and those years in Hong Kong, there were mountains of trash on the streets, you know, and everything. There was a lot of bad smells. So, but it didn't matter. This is mission. I enjoy it. And my friend says, never make a decision, an important decision of our life, when you are on an emotional high. Uh, when you are on an emotional low. If so, anything goes bad, it, I'm never going to go back again. Like for instance, a woman gets a baby and she has so much pain, she says, I'll never have another baby in my life, you know. <laughs> like like the, 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 the terrible pain and the terrible uh, suffering of the time makes you want to make a decision, a rash decision, and pictures, you're responding to, to the pain and to the, the, the negative uh, emotions, says, I will never, and then the other one is so happy, you know, I'm on a mission field. I'm moving to Hong Kong, you know. And then he says, let it die, let it cool off. And if it is God who is in that, he will ra raise it back. It will come back. And then you can analyze and you can decide and everything. So it's a bit the descriptions of this self-control thing here. Keep your head. 
Don't go rush into something. Don't be too impetuous about uh, doing something uh, good or bad. And don't lose your focus, like for instance, for the work of an evangelist. Endure suffering. There's a context of suffering. But continue to be an evangelist. Keep your focus. Remain loyal. Regardless of the circumstance, you're an evangelist not because of the circumstance. You're an evangelist because God called you to be. So, so self-control reminds you that. Why am I here? What's going on in my life? Who am I serving? You know, self-control helps you to think and not panic and do something. I'm quitting because I don't like your face anymore, you know. <laughs> So uh, we, we don't do this, this, kind, this, this kind of things. The, the next one is be sober, be watchful, your adversary, the devil, uh, prowls around you. Here we have the devil. The devil is our fiercest, the most dangerous person that has to do with our life. The destroyer, the, the murderer, the, the, the liar, the, you know, and everything. So he is there. So we need that self, that attributes of self-control, the clear mind, the clear head to differentiate, to know what's really happening. This is a time of testing. This is a time of temptation. The devil is trying to entrap me into this and to that. We see clearly, we keep our focus and everything. And then the, the next one, there are two words of the two groups. And First Peter chapter 4, verse 7, you see two of the words, the sophos, the wisdom, the first, therefore, be self-control. The end of all things is at hand, therefore be self-control is like the wisdom part of it. The wisdom that says, be reasonable, be of good sense, judgment, sensibly, prudent, moderation, mental soundness. Have that. And sober-minded, that is the need for one, keep a clear mind for the sake of your prayers. Don't lose your identity. Jesus is coming again. What's your life going to be? Are you prepared? Are you ready? You know, so this aspect of the work of the Holy Spirit is very, very important. And I want to conclude with very fast, I'll go fast over the sections. Other benefits to those who exercise uh, self-control or spirit inner control. First, people with self-control master their, their moods. You know, events, people, bad news, uh, sickness, or whatever uh, affect us, but do not let your mood master you. People with self-control master their moods. We make a lot of judgment and decisions and it will affect our relationship, our moods. I'm not happy today, so don't talk to me, don't, spit on, don't, don't step on my toes, like, uh, don't talk to me after, before breakfast because you will know what, uh, you know, uh, I d didn't sleep well last night, so. <laughs> people with self-control master their moods. Number two, people with self-control watch their words. This is one of the worst, worst areas where we mess up our relationship, we hurt people, we regret what we have said in our words, we have so much destructions because of this little member in our mouth. People with self-control watch their words. Okay, be careful what you see and protect your life. A careless talker destroys himself. That's Proverb 13.3. The first one was uh, about the moods. A person without self-control is like a city with broken walls down. Number three, people with self-control restrain, restrain their reactions. Uh, how much does it take before you lose your cool? and you really shout and you get angry or you hit someone or whatever. Uh, if you are sensible, you will control your temper. When someone wrongs you, it is a great virtue to ignore it. That's Proverb 19. People with self-control stick to their schedule. Oh, I love this one as a pastor. Sunday morning, people will be on time. If you don't determine how you will spend your time, then others will decide for you. And it's not only about punctuality, getting on time at church, but it's about what time you sleep, what time you do things, uh, and what you are planning for the objectives of your life, like time management of, of some sorts. Some of us are good, some of us are, are completely unable to do that, but it is part of, of the Holy Spirit can help you. If you have problems with 
you know, organizing the time and your life, the Holy Spirit is able to, to help you on that. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. People with self-control manage their money. Oh, this is a hard one because, you know, money or no money when it's time to buy. We just get credit, like I said before. They learn to live on less because you have a budget. A budget is good, a budget, or having nowhere, how much money, where your money is spending, and live with the principle of never going in debt. The borrower is slave to the lender. Proverbs says, never sign or co-sign for somebody else because you get into the same trouble and everything. So people with self-control manage money. It's time to buy. It's not time to buy. Let's wait. Be patient. Use the so fast, the wisdom. Keep your mind clear. Keep your focus. Have the power to abstain in some things. Control your spending. Don't get crazy. I have Consult before in marital counseling couples just with this problem here. People, they are not together anymore. Money, and I know many couples that have just come to my mind, just I speak to you. They have divorced because of this problem. Control of money, no self-control, spending. One was frugal, one was spending in excess. They could not get on the middle ground. And one was paying the debts of the others. One was making more debts then the person could pay it back on the other side. And then after years of tr struggling, seeing counselors, pastors, they had the Holy Spirit, but they didn't follow the Holy Spirit and they got into divorce. The value of a budget tells you where you, your money, where you want it and to go rather than just let it go. And the house of the wise are stores of choice, food and oil, but a foolish man divorces all he has. So we don't want to do that, live a life like this, and then you have no more money because you didn't have control and then you spend. People with self-control maintain their health. Isn't that the greatest gift that you have as a human being, health? Remove your health today, what are you going to do? You will not be here today serving and working and earning money and everything. My mother was 88 years old, who drives, swim, walks, cooks, do groceries and everything, remind me almost every single time when we talk over the phone to watch over my health and to my, my wife's health. She always talks, does she do health for your wife? Tell her not to overwork, don't burn the candle by the two hands or something like that. Take care of your, of your health. People with self-control will know what's good, bad, and they will follow what is reasonable. Uh, the diet, the sleeping, the working, the overworking, the ambitions that we have sometimes to become workaholic and everything. Learn to appreciate and give dignity to your body, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.4. 4. So let's, let's stand this morning.